So uh, welcome everyone to uh, this uh, launch event of the Scilab Lab uh, data repository and happy that you are joining this. Um, I will just briefly show you the agenda for our sessions today. We will be having an introduction um, followed by a presentation from the Figshare side. And then we will also hear a couple of different user perspectives um, followed by uh, a presentation uh, about FAIR in the bigger picture, really. Um, you are free to ask uh, questions in the chat while we go along, but also there will be a Q&A session at the end where you can uh, directly bring up your questions with the speakers. So I will uh, start off then by handing over to uh, Yuan Ru, I'm the head of the Xylef Lab Data Center for an introduction. I'll stop sharing. All right. So hi, I'm Yuan. Uh, welcome everyone. Happy to see you all this morning. I will give you here. So um, the Scilab Lab data repository, this is built on the, uh, with the Figshare uh, software. So this is a Figshare system. We're happy to have Megan Hardman here from, from Figshare to help us launch this today. We've been piloting this for almost a year now and, and working out technical things and testing out with users how to, how to work with reviewing and submissions and stuff. So now we feel that we're ready to really launch this as a, as a full-blown service. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to through, go through this just very quickly as an introduction uh, to, the, to the service itself and essentially asking, um, uh, replying to a few frequently asked questions simply. So um, what is this really? Well, uh, this is a web-based system to publish data. So what kind can go in here? Almost anything. Very typical thing would be, for example, data that you would choose to um, uh, have a supplemental data for a publication, for example, or it can be things that you are working on, or it can be things that you want to publish in this one, addition to something else. It's very wide. You can almost anything can go in here. But what isn't this? It's not storage. It's not used. You not shouldn't use this just to store data or so to use as a primary solution for data sharing within an active project. This is really a system to publish data. That's what it's for. If you're publishing in here, it, it, even if you can keep it, um, you can keep it confidential for some time, but it will go public. So who can actually use this one now? This is a survey from the Scilab Lab Data Center. And we have a national mandate for the um, for services for the uh, life science community in the country. And we, um, any researcher at the Swedish academic institution working in Scilab Lab areas of activity can use this. And we are not going to charge anything for this. So, the next thing, what is in what is this really? What, what can you upload and how does the data work? So this is a, an example here. You will have in an upload, you will see file previews of the things that you have uploaded, the files that you have attached. You can get uh, you will get a, a digital object identifier immediately uh, that you can reserve for something that is not yet published and you can go on and, and work with this one. This is something that often is required, for example, from, from journals, but it's also a permanent identifier to the data itself. So this helps making your data fair if you publish here. You also have data versioning, as you can see here. So if you are updating an item, you will create a new version and you can go back and have the traceability backwards and see what data has been looking like before. You get statistics, how many people have viewed and downloaded your item that you have uploaded. Um, you can also work with um, get data authorship. So this can, uh, in here, you can list the people who have actually worked on producing or working on the data. And um, this doesn't have to be identical to the paper authorship, but it's a way to, to help uh, with attribution to the data, data set itself. You describe the item and then you can basically describe as much as you want. You can 
from reference to other re repositories. Say, for example, that you might have deposited data at the EBI, and you, you are not always getting a digital object identifier with the EBI depositions. So this is a way to link up and you can collect items that have been published elsewhere and bring everything together so that in, in one item you will have essentially all the links off to, to all the data and the material that comes in with the study. You have a, a possibility to give credit to your funders and add various types of, of category keywords, other types of metadata to make the, the um, data set findable. You can also uh, attach a license to this that will describe and then specify how a user can, can use the data set. There's a number of standard licenses and we can also help if this is if you have questions about this. And of course, you can link up to the paper itself if you have a, if this is something that is linked to a specific paper. It doesn't have to be like that. You can upload, for example, if you have a PowerPoint presentation that you've done or something like that. And of course, you can also add the uh, contact information to your publishing, to your organization, your host organization, and also the email addresses for yourself as, as an uploader, but also if some other person or some other entity are organizing, for example, um, access control requests, if you have submitted a data set that is a metadata item only. So a few of the questions. If you upload here, will the data still be yours? Yes, of course. Um, you will choose with this license how you specify how the data will be used. Um, should you always publish in here? No. That's uh, no, a lot can be published in here. And it's very general in the way that, it, but we also recommend that if you have, for example, large amounts of raw data coming up, this is not really the suitable way because you, it's the best thing to, for findability is to submit to a data type specific repository. So for those types of data, we will recommend that you uh, go to the EBI or NCBI archives where you can attach proper metadata and, and get. If you don't get the DOI there, you can create an item in the figure here to be able to link up and, and get the DOI linked to an object identifier in the in one of the EBI archives, for example. If you, um, like I said, if you are going to publish something, but you don't want to make the data set public right away, you might want to work on it. You might want to put the data set up so that only the reviewers, um, if you have submitted the paper to a journal, for example, then you can reserve a DOI and you can keep the data set embargoed and open privately for reviewers, for example. There, there are various ways to conditionally um, publish a data set for, for a limited audience or for a limited time. Should you publish anything? Absolutely no. There's a lot of data that you cannot publish here. Of course, you can only publish what you actually have the right to publish. You cannot publish, for example, material that is covered by a license that doesn't allow for reuse. This means, for example, that if you are working with uh, images, if you have published, for if you have, for example, made a PowerPoint presentation and you have included images that you have found on the web that's not suitable because that would be republishing stuff that would be li uh, on license so try to choose things that have a, a proper license if you want to reuse it and, re and republish it um, and of course you cannot publish anything that is sensitive data this is really for publishing and everyone is aware using this system it will go public so you cannot go and do anything here that is supposed to be private or uh, protected. If you have published, can you remove it? No, it's permanent. That's part of the point of publishing stuff. It's it's a kind of, it, it, it's a benefit of the service actually. It will be permanent. And the service itself, is that permanent? And that's for sure a yes, as long as figure share exists or data center exists, we're going to keep this up. Um, and of course, if there's any reason that the service would be discontinued for say, for example, that Scilab Lab would never more get any funding or something like that, then we will, the data will be exported or migrated to other solutions. So nothing will ever be lost. I think that this is a, a very secure future proof way. 
So how do you go about to actually submit something? Well, this is going to be covered in detail later on, but um, we have a page. We have a lot of web pages and we have a good support team for this one that will help you. And we um, data sets will go through review and a curation process. So you can see in this picture here that is also on the web page is linked to the uh, that as a submitter, you would start by creating a new item and update the or update an existing item. You would fill in the metadata and, and maybe if you uh, need to upload data files, then you, you would upload those and you create a tentative item for reviewing. And then you submit this and at, at the point of submission, then there will be a reviewer assigned to your item. And the reviewer will go through this item to look and to make sure that, the, that it is an appropriate uh, submission. Uh, for and we'll review it for uh, findability, accessibility, reusability, and so on, so that you can actually, so we can help you from reviewer side to make the item as fair as possible, and help you with advice on on how to adjust metadata and so on. And um, in this process, we will often have a dialogue with with you as a submitter, and then you yourself or we can help you modify the items until everyone is happy and when it's happy we will just approve this and publish it in the repository and the doi will be assigned so this is a relatively short process we often complete all these things within a week and we are happy to have a good team here at the data center and also happy that we have great help from our friends at the NBIS, the National Bioinformatics Infrastructure, who have a data management team who is also helping out with this. So how do you actually log in to this service? If you go to the, the uh, URL that we have uh, for this, you will simply log in using your existing university ID, the regular authentication method, and you will have an account set up in that way. So this is what's called SWOM ID identification in, in Sweden. So how do you use data that is in the repository or in other figure instances? Well, you simply search and browse and download and stick to what it says in the license. The license will specify how you can use it. And remember, it's always nice to credit the author. And sometimes actually the license requires you to credit. And it also um, is important to see if the license, for example, adds criteria on if you can actually use it and, and change it and so on. So there's a number of links. We can post this up uh, later. And we are very happy to get contributions or feedback uh, from the whole community about the service. So we can shape this and work on this. So now it's the launch, but we expect this to to build up and, and uh, stabilize as a great service for you. So happy to provide this. And now I'm done for, for this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, we will uh, go on with a presentation from Megan Hardman, who's a uh, head of engagement at Figshare about storing, sharing, and citing your data with Salafs Lab Figshare. So, Please, Megan, we're very happy to have you here and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. Okay. Yes. Um, lovely, thank you. Um, so yes, um, Tana said, my name is Megan Hardiman. I'm head of engagement at Figshare. Um, and that means a number of things. So that's doing launch events like this at SciLife Lab. Um, I also help with um, developing marketing materials and videos and sort of um, the community side of Figshare as well. Um, so sharing what other institutions are doing with Figshare and I'll kind of show you some examples of, of what you can what you can do in Figshare and what's being done um, already. Um, so that being said, um, I just wanted to give a brief overview. I know Johan gave sort of a an, an understanding of, of what Figshare looks like, what item pages look like, and things like that. Um, and some of this will cover that as well, so you'll have a very, very thorough understanding um, of what, what Figshare um, can do, what the possibilities are. Um, but first of all, Figshare is a cloud-based platform, so um, it's something you can log into anywhere, whether you're at home or, or on site or elsewhere, um, when that's a thing again. Um, 
and it benefits from regular updates. So we go through um, normally about every month or every other month, there's a new release uh, where new features become automatically implemented into Figshare. So any feedback that you provide based on how you'd like the system to be improved um, definitely gets taken on board um, and implemented in, in that way. Um, and it's also used for securely storing research data. So, you know, as, as was mentioned, it's not a storage platform, but in order to publish data, um, you would upload it into Figshare and have it be stored there with the idea that it would be published um, when, it's, when it's suitable to be published either immediately or, you know, as was mentioned under an embargo um, uh, to start with. Um, data on Figshare is also discoverable. Um, so it doesn't just exist within SciLife's lab, SciLife Labs instance of Figshare. Uh, it gets fed into the wider um, sort of bucket of institutions who are using Figshare as um, for, for data um, and not just within Figshare, but also discoverable outside of Figshare. So things that are um, submitted into your instance of Figshare uh, automatically get marked up for indexing in search engines and things like Google Scholar and Google Dataset Search, which is um, Google's fairly recent um, data um, search engine. Um, so it's not just about making it available for, for you to cite and for people within SciLife Lab to be able to look at and reuse and cite, but the wider community of, of of uh, people who are using research data. Um, and then everything is citable, so everything automatically gets uh, a DOI which you can cite um, and, and others can cite as well. Uh, so there's a couple different, I guess, reasons why people use Figshare. Um, the first being the opportunity to store your outputs in any file format. So there's no restriction on the type of file that you can upload into Figshare. Uh, and we aim to preview all of them in the browser. So on this, um, I'm just gonna go back, on this um, item page that you're looking at here, um, this is a 3D file, so it's an STL file. Um, and we is, it's one of the files that we create a preview for. Um, so I think there's about 1,200 file types that we preview. So that means that when you upload it, um, people can interact with it directly in the browser without necessarily having to download it, which is really nice from an engagement perspective. Like it's really cool to be able to look at this um, tooth as it rotates around and you can actually um, zoom in and zoom out and, and see what it looks like um, without necessarily having to have the software to, to run it in order to be able to interact with it. Um, you can also securely collaborate with researchers from other institutions. So there is some functionality within Figshare that allows you to create um, a project space and invite people to join your project. And they can be people from within SciLife Lab or outside as well. So they can be other institutions, they could be industry collaborators, um, whatever, whatever sort of setup you have within your, um, your particular project. Um, and you can work within that space privately, um, upload items, sort of comment on them, say, oh, maybe this needs a bit more metadata or can you change that file format or something like that. Um, and then eventually publish it all, all within, all within Figshare collaboratively. Um, so everything gets a DOI, everything that's published on Figshare um, gets a DOI. You can demonstrate impact with altmetrics, usage metrics, and citation counts. So these happen automatically. They're automatically tracked as soon as the item gets published. Um, for altmetrics, um, if you're not familiar with altmetrics, they are um, alternative metrics. So it's um, tracking um, reuse of your data on things like social media and blogs and patents and um, media outlets, things like that. Um, and that happens automatically um, as well. So I'll show you um, a bit of what that looks like uh, in a moment. Some people use it for open access funder compliance as well. Um, so if your funder says that you have to make your data openly available um, at a certain point within uh, your research, then Figshare meets that compliance need. Um, so things are you know, made openly available, though there are conditions that you can place on them if it's appropriate to do so. I'll mention that in a bit as well. 
Um, the last thing is to help others discover your outputs on Google Scholar. So I mentioned that everything is marked up for indexing in search engines um, and having it be discoverable and available for reuse by other people is a, a really key reason for people uh, using Figshare. Uh, so SciLife Lab has its own Figshare data repository and that's at scilifelab.figshare.com. You can go there now and have a look at, at what some of the data looks like that's already been published there. But it's essentially um, a place for everything to be published um, within SciLife Lab. So you can go there, you can browse by certain groups, you can browse by categories, um, you can have a look at all the things that have already been published. Um, I wanted to show you what an item looks like on Figshare. So I know it's kind of gone, been gone through briefly, um, but I will, I'm just gonna go through it just one more time because um, I think it's I think it's really worth showing. Um, and I won't go through the, the data on here because I know that Michael is speaking um, later. So I'm not here to talk about the data. Um, I'm just gonna talk about some of the features that exist on item pages and what items look like on Figshare and things like that. Um, so this is an, an example of an item on Figshare. You can have items that have a single file in them, if that's appropriate, or you can have lots of different files. And we have items on Figshare that have um, hundreds, even thousands of files in them. So um, it should be suitable uh, for, for your purposes, hopefully. Um, but you can have a look at all the files that are in a particular item on the left here, and you can toggle between list view and thumbnail view and things like that. And then you can actually interact with the files um, in the preview here. So things like um, video files, as you can see here, you can actually watch them. Uh, audio files, you can hear them. And um, there's a, a Word document as well. So you can have a look at that directly in the browser, but you also have the option to download um, either individual files within an item or um, all of the files uh, if you want to. Um, and Sort of below the files themselves is all of the metadata. So the things like title, the option to um, cite this particular item, um, what the DOI is and whether there are multiple versions, you can have a look at what older versions look like. Um, you can see the usage metrics here. You can see if there's a peer reviewed publication that's related to this particular um, data, you can click through and it'll take you to the publication itself. You can browse the categories as well. So um, if I were to click on cell biology, it would take me to all of the items in which um, cell biology is listed as a category. So this is really nice for discoverability as well. So people um, from other institutions or even people who don't, their institution doesn't use Figshare, but they use it to find and reuse data. If they're looking under a particular category, then they'll come across SciLife Lab data uh, as well. Exact same with keywords. Um, so I could click on bacteria, for example, and it'll show me all of the items in which bacteria is listed as a keyword in the, the bigger Figshare ecosystem. Um, and then there's the, the description here on the left. Um, popping back to the right, there's the license that was chosen by the author and I can click on that. It'll take me to the Creative Commons website and it'll tell me exactly what I can and cannot do under the perimeters of a CC BY license. So this, um, I think this is quite good for peace of mind of knowing um, if somebody comes onto my data on Figshare um, and they're not, they want to reuse it, but they're not quite sure um, how they can, um, then it, it gives them sort of clear instructions as to, to what's possible under the license that I've assigned to the item. Um, and then you can see some information about when it was submitted, when it was first online, then the posted date, um, who the publisher is, and then some contact details. Um, so um, there are some customizations that can be made as well. Things like additional custom metadata, which can be fig configured by SciLife Lab. And if that's something that um, is needed can be, can be added. Uh, quite easily as well. Um, we also have things like um, the projects that I mentioned um, and collections as well. And if you want to see some examples of those, then I'd be happy to show you. 
Um, I'm going to go back to my presentation. Um, so that item that I showed you was openly available. I didn't have to have a login to access it. I didn't have to have you know, a subscription to Figshare or anything like that. So everything that's published on Figshare is um, openly available. Um, and we tend to go by the, the phrase as open as possible, as closed as necessary, which is a very commonly used phrase in um, data management. Um, so we encourage people to make their data as open as possible and with uh, a license that is as reusable as, as possible. Um, but appreciate that there are things that maybe shouldn't be or can't be publicly available, either you know, for a certain amount of time or um, perhaps even permanently. So there's functionality within Figshare to be able to um, apply embargoes, and those can be set for a certain amount of time or indefinitely. Um, embargoes that are applied to items on Figshare um, once the embargo time has passed, then they become automatically lifted. So you don't have to remember to come back in and um, lift the embargo, but you can go back in and change the date. So if you need to extend it for whatever reason, then you can do that um, by going into the system and editing it. Um, you can generate a private link. So I know um, Johanna mentioned this very briefly, um, but you have the option when you're uh, working on a private item in Figshare to generate a private link and to share that with somebody else. Um, so this could be used to share it with a colleague just to have a look at before you publish it, make sure that everything looks okay. But it can also be used for um, blind peer review. So when we generate a private link, we remove the author and the institution information. Um, so it's just the rest of the metadata and the files. And you could use that for um, for, for peer review. You also have the option to reserve a DLI. So you don't have to do this in order to publish. Um, we automatically mint a DLI as soon as you publish the item. Um, but if you wanted to reserve a DLI as part of a publication, then you could come into Figshare and reserve that DLI and share it with a publisher, for example, and say, this is going to be the, the DLI for my data. Um, it's not published yet, but as soon as the article is published, then I'll go back in into my Figshare item and publish it. Um, so, yeah, a couple of options around um, making data closed where necessary or restricted where necessary, um, and a couple of sort of sharing options as well. So what can you upload to Figshare? So I mentioned that we accept any file format you can upload any file type onto Figshare and we preview about 1,200 file types in the browser. So this is um, a, a video. Um, you can see that you can view it, uh, you can pause it um, directly in the browser, really, which is really nice um, for engagement. Um, things like images. So uh, this is a JPEG. Um, we preview those in the browser as well. Audio files. Um, so this is an MP3, but again, you can listen to it, pause it, change the volume, all of that directly um, within the, the viewer for this particular item. 3D files. So this is another um, 3D file that we preview. This is a PLY file as opposed um, to the STL one from before, um, but it works the exact same way. So you can actually move it around um, completely, you can zoom in, zoom out. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it looks really cool, I think. Um, code. So people use um, Figshare to uh, sort of take snippets of what code looks like at a particular point in time. Um, so for this, we have an integration with GitHub. Um, so if you use GitHub for um, storing code, then you can sync your GitHub account to your Figshare account and push um, sort of snapshots of code um, into Figshare and get a DOI for it as well. Um, so that's quite nice. We have an, um, uh, an example of somebody who uses um, GitHub and the Figshare integration to um, 
at a certain time every night, they take a snapshot of the code and upload it into Fixture. And this item has, um, it generates a new version each time. They send it from GitHub to Figshare. And I think there are there's something like almost 2000 versions of an item. So um, that's quite an extreme example, um, but that's just to say that um, you can use the integra integration with GitHub to continuously take sna snapshots of code, maybe not quite that frequently, um, but that it will support that if that's what you wanna do. Um, we also have people who use Figshare to upload posters, um, particularly ones, obviously they're gonna be presenting it at conferences. Um, some people will upload the poster before they present it at a conference. Um, and then on the poster include either a QR code or a link uh, to the poster's DOI um, so that people can look at it while they're at the conference as well. And I think that's quite nice. Sometimes um, maybe you don't get around to all of the posters or you saw something on there, um, but you wanted to, to look at it in a bit more detail um, outside of the conference. And that makes it really easy for people to, um, to look at it beyond the conference as well. Not only that, but people who maybe aren't able to attend the conference, but are still interested in, in what you're working on, um, will be able to see it as well. So I think that's that's really nice. And again, because it's a PDF, um, so that's something that we, we will preview without having to download it in order to look at it. People also upload presentations onto Figshare. So this is a PowerPoint file. Um, and you can sort of toggle through all of the slides um, directly in the browser, again, without having to download it. So I mentioned um, briefly earlier about projects. So I just wanted to go into that in a bit more depth. So um, a project is a collaborative space um, where you can work with either researchers from your institution or outside. Um, and it's a private area that you can work on um, with the idea that it then becomes published when it's ready or when it's appropriate to do so. Um, so within the wrapper of a, a project, you would then upload items into it. So you can see the screenshot here is an example of a project that I'm a, a collaborator on. So um, within the project, I can either upload individual items. So these two are items that I've uploaded, or I can leave um, a, a note on the project as a whole. So, you know, in this case, I've explained sort of what the parameters of the project are and um, encouraging people to upload things that we've worked on within the project um, into this Figshare project space as well. Um, you can leave comments on individual items. So there's this sort of um, speech bubble uh, icon here. So on each individual item, um, if I had a bit of feedback on um, maybe some changes that, that could be made or um, any kind of conversation that I'd like to have around this particular item, I can do that um, through the comments section. Um, so within a project, you can add collaborators or viewers. So collaborators are people who can um, upload items into the project, they can leave comments, they can leave notes. Um, whereas viewers are people who can just see the items in the project. So um, they don't have the ability to upload, um, but they can, they can have a look at everything. So yeah, it just depends on what sort of um, functionality restrictions you'd like to place on those particular people. So you can invite institutional colleagues, you can invite people who use um, any sort of instance within the Figshare uh, domain. So there's other universities that use Figshare as a data repository, you can invite them. There's a free figshare.com, which you might have come across um, in the past, which is um, specifically for end users to use um, and to upload the research data into. There's some differences in functionality, it's a bit more restricted um, for the free figshare.com version as opposed to an institutional instance of Figshare, which is what Scilift Lab has, um, where you can invite people with no Figshare account to join your project. So if you have um, uh, like industry collaborators that you work uh, with, and maybe they don't have a figshare.com account and they're not from a university or an institution, 
they can create um, a free account and join your project. Um, so projects themselves can either be kept private, but you can publish each individual item within the project, or you can make the project itself public as well. Um, yeah, whichever is, is most appropriate. We also have collections and collections are ways of grouping data together uh, into um, a collection for lack of a better word. Um, the difference, the major difference between projects and collections is that in collections, everything is already published and publicly available. So you can work within a project space and collaborate privately and then publish. Um, whereas a collection, everything is already public and you're just adding those items to your collection. Um, so you can pull data from uh, things that you yourself have uploaded um, as individual items, or you can add things to a collection that other people have uploaded as well. So you might have um, other collaborators who have uploaded things into their own um, account on Figshare, um, but you want to add their, their items alongside your items into a collection and have it sort of all be wrapped up nicely together. Um, and you can even add things that people have uploaded into other instances of Figshare. Um, so it doesn't have to just be within SiteLife Labs as well. Um, you also get a DOI for a collection. So under projects, each individual item that's published gets its own DOI, has its own metadata. And if you publish the project, um, there's a little bit of metadata around the project that, that gets published as well. Um, but for collections, the collection itself gets a DOI. Um, so we ask for a little bit more metadata when filling it in. Um, but that means that you can actually provide the DOI for the collection um, to you know, a, a publisher or, or whomever, um, and they'll be able to access all of the items within the collection as well. So um, that's really nice to be able to kind of have a single um, citable DOI that you can share with people that shows lots of different items as well. Um, and just like items, collections can have versions. So you can add items to a collection and then publish it and then decide you want to add some more items to the collection and then publish that. It will generate a new version and people can go back and look at old versions um, and sort of see how the collection has progressed over time. Um, just like on item pages, collections themselves, we will track usage statistics, so views um, of the collection. Uh, downloads will be for each individual item, so there's no way to download all of the items within a collection, but you can do it by going into the item uh, pages for each item in the collection. Um, and we'll track citations for the collection as well, because there's a DOI for the collection itself. And then alt metrics. Um, on collections as well. Um, Figshare has an API. So if you have um, any uh, need to programmatically be moving data uh, and metadata into or out of Figshare, then you can do it with the API. Um, this is an example of, um, so this is the data that's um, published and, and hosted on Figshare. Uh, and then on the right is a, um, an institutional repository page. This is just on WordPress. Uh, and they use the API to um, take the, the data files that are on Figshare and create a visualization of it on WordPress. Um, so it's sort of the, Figshare sort of the back end for the data as it's presented on their institutional repository. So there's loads you can do with the API. You can create um, visualizations um, on websites like St. Edward's University has done here. Um, you can create integrations with other systems and there are some that already exist that either we have developed or other institutional um, users have developed as well. Um, yeah, the possibilities are pretty endless with uh, the API. Um, I already mentioned the GitHub integration, so I'll move through this one briefly. Um, but just to say, you can 
connect your GitHub account to your Figshare account. Um, and, uh, oh, this is the example that I mentioned earlier where they take a snapshot every day. And um, this is quite an old, um, quite an old image of it actually, because um, they're onto their thousands of uh, versions now. But um, yeah, that's, that's what that item looks like. So um, yeah, the possibility of taking a snapshot of your code in GitHub and putting it into your Figshare is possible with the integration. Um, we also have groups um, on Figshare. So um, these are pages, public pages that sit within your instance of Figshare. Um, and within that, you can have individual items, you can have projects, you can have collections, but they're all sort of within this group container. Um, so there's already one um, on your instance of Figshare for a lab, and that's a very common use case for groups. Um, you can sort of see this um, research station group from Stockholm University who use Figshare as their data repository. And um, so you can have uh, a background image, you can have a logo and really give it some nice um, branding identity. Um, or you don't have to, um, but yeah, it's, it's a possibility, but it's just a nice way of um, having all of your content, whether it's items, projects, collections, all within a single landing page. Um, we, I think it was toward the end of last year, um, upgraded our search functionality as well to include faceted search. Um, so within SciLife Lab, Sci Labs instance of Figshare, you can do some really nice searching based on item type, on licenses, on groups, on categories. Um, I think it was earlier this, no, last month, uh, we also added sorting by um, top alt metric score and top cited items. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's really nice for finding content. You also have the option to, if you're doing a search, to include content that appears across all instances of Figshare if you want to. Um, we also have um, some examples of uh, people using Figshare for funder compliance. So I mentioned if they require um, sort of open access publishing of content, um, then Figshare supports that. So this is an example of, um, it's, it was actually an assessment body as, a, as opposed to a funder necessarily, but the, the concept is the same. Um, so they created a collection and then within that had each individual item uh, for the assessment body. So it was a combination of their own research so like these um photo documentations um and i think they had some yeah they had some videos as well but they also had documentation around um the the research timeline and um things relating to like data management plans and things like that that they uploaded into the collection and had it all wrapped together in a single place um so uh I thought that was a really nice use case and certainly something um, that, that can be done can be done in Figshare. Um, right, I think that's everything. Um, I would be very happy to answer questions at the end. I know there's um, some time for that. Um, so yeah, please let me know if you have any. But that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan, for that, I mean, very nice and thorough, I mean, overview of both the system and the characteristics and functionalities. I think that's really useful for, for all the people listening. And so we will now switch to a session of um, several short um, users perspective uh, presentations. And so we will start by having a presentation from, presentation from Vijan Pelicano from uh, KI, and he's also a Startup Lab Fellow. So I will leave the word to you. Thank you. Give me one second to share. Okay, and now. I imagine that you can see it now? Yes. Perfect. So yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, uh, wanted to to simplify how we have been using i saw that already some of my <laughs> slides have been shown before but i just wanted to to give the feeling uh, how useful is this kind of resource from uh, from the user's perspective so my lab works mainly in, in genomics so uh, we generate quite a lot of uh, ngs data and uh, and do a lot of new methods 
So sometimes some of the repositories are not exactly what we need. So uh, before uh, the repository emerged, so as I had the need to, to have some data uh, for evaluation or for, for users, uh, I just did a, something that uh, it works, but it's not a good long-term solution. That is, I just put it in my lab website uh, as a downloader because they were just uh, much bigger than the 50 megabases that many journals allow. Uh, but it was not in formats that uh, the, the classical repositories will, will uh, uh, accept. So uh, why? Uh, so why I'm using this now, and I will continue using more in the future. Uh, of course, one way is to provide additional data for, for reviewers and for, for the readers of the papers. Uh, in another, is a bit of a selfish way uh, to make sure that we create all intermediate data while it's fresh, because we all know that uh, we move labs, uh, people leave, people come. So sometimes data that are fresh when this expertise uh, disappears, they may be fresh for a couple of years, but then after that, uh, it's useless. Or the data is there, but it's not easy to interpret. So it's a way to force myself to make sure it's in a very accessible way, while everyone involved in the project is still on the project, and we can make it accessible, even if it's only for ourselves. Uh, but that makes it kind of easier for everyone. Uh, and of course, if you provide easy data, uh, people is more likely to use it and then of course increase the impact. So which kind of data we we use? So we do things like, I don't know, RNC, chip seek, uh, and these kind of methods. So of course, we just establish uh, uh, data repositories like Geo or, or Array Space, where we have the, the FASTQ data, the original data, and, and then uh, we can also add some kind of tracks that are in a specific format. So of course that's the primary place because that's where the community uses it. Uh, but then of course, going from that to what we have in the paper, there is always a lot of steps. And of course, in addition to share the, the, the scripts and so on, uh, in the journal at the end, you only have some kind of maybe some summary table, some uh, Excel sheet where you have all the final curated data. But in some cases you have some data that it's important, but it's way too big. Uh, and uh, that's where I think uh, we are trying to use the, the, the Scilab repository. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, things that we have put there, uh, like uh, intermediate data sets that can uh, facilitate the, the, the analysis. They are not the final curated, they are not the initial, uh, and they for some reason don't fit in the, in the normal repository, so we put them there. Uh, in some cases, some genome tracks that uh, also, they are not the classical format that, uh, that for example, GEO accepts. For our kind of analysis, it is the way to interpret the data much better. So that's what we put it there. And then, of course, uh, when you run some programs that uh, provide some, uh, some output uh, or examples, uh, this is very useful. So we have developed some, some programs. And then uh, when we apply these programs that we develop in our, in our uh, data, uh, it's easier to provide these interactive, uh, in our case, HTML files that are interactive and people can highlight the region, zoom in, zoom out, and these kind of things. And that's kind of uh, not so uh, fitting. So that's also a very good place to put that. So for example, uh, this is the, the data that we have there. No, not so many, but, uh, uh, but we will put more. Uh, uh, so I just wanted to highlight a couple of different uh, different kinds. So uh, I'm going to talk for this one. And this was one was a bit uh, uh, different. So TIFSIC is a method that we develop that basically links the five prime transcription site of a gene with the polyadenylation site. So with some kind of uh, technology in between long read sequencing and short read sequencing. So we use short read sequencing to make a kind of boundaries of the genes. Uh, and we published this before, uh, and uh, when uh, uh, the kind of short reads that you have in the geo, you can reconstruct what we analyze, but uh, you don't have an easy to browse, you have to do some processing to really browse. So what we decided, and this was in fact uh, almost one year after we published the paper, 
And in fact, before the postdoc was leaving, I was saying, okay, let's, I have this here, but let's make this, this uh, data in a browsing, the ones that we use internally to browse or to make the, the snapshots of the figures. So this looks like a normal read, but in fact, it's not a normal read. It's a synthetic read that we constructed by linking uh, two real reads. Uh, but this is what you use to explore the, the boundaries of the transcriptome. Uh, so we put this in, in this format. And uh, I was surprised that the other day when I was preparing this that uh, uh, 70 people downloaded it. And this was very surprising because unfortunately, as this, I did not uh, think at the proper time to put this in the, in the reference. This is not cited in the, in the main paper, uh, how it should be. Uh, but nevertheless, it's in my website. And if you uh, look at it, you can find the, the information. So there is uh, uh, 70 people or, or maybe a few less, but there is people who downloaded the data who probably are browsing to look for their gene of interest. And uh, what is more important that I did not need to reply any email. So uh, I, I, don't have, I did not have the problem of this uh, activation uh, barrier because sometimes when you want some data, if it's only mildly interesting, you will not put the time to bother the author. Uh, so probably many of these people will never have emailed me. I would have sent it uh, other way, but it's much easier. They just see it, they look, if they like good, if they don't like it, also good. So that was very useful. Uh, another kind of data is, uh, for example, uh, this, uh, this uh, kind of data that, uh, that we have a, a program that we developed that is this 5 c that provides you this kind of HTML uh, uh, interactive and you can highlight things and remove things. So it's very useful to dissect the biology, but this is kind of a relatively big vectorial images that you can download, uh, but doesn't fit really in the format. It's a bit too detailed for a journal where you would try to distill all the information. So we are now also putting uh, uh, regularly these kind of plots here for people to browse. And they can download it and they can analyze and, and, and so on. In fact, now we, I think we have to finish some version of the GitHub and put it also here because we have it only in GitHub. So we will also put that probably in the next months. Uh, so why I will recommend to use it for others? Uh, so, I mean, it has been already said many times here, but basically uh, publish data that are uh, not suited for other reasons. Uh, of course, uh, it makes it reusable. In some cases, I also put an embargo and that was uh, because the, the other co-authors prefer to have it in, in embargo. So we put it there and there was no problem. We sent the link, people could download it, but it was kind of private. And of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, it was very helpful to all the help that we got from the, from the data office to, to make this work. So I will uh, highly encourage uh, to, to use it. It's much better than your personal website, <laughs> that's for sure. And I think that's, uh, that's all I wanted to, to tell uh, from my side. Thank you very much. I think that's really useful for, for others to hear how this repository can be used. And we will uh, switch to our next uh, user perspective. So we will have a presentation from Jonne Rittig uh, from Uppsala University. So please go ahead. So good morning, everyone. So indeed, my name is Diana, and I'm a PhD student at the Pharmaceutical Bioinformatics Group at Uppsala University. And today I will share with you uh, my experiences with using the Scilab Lab data repository. I will explain you what this nice image here on the first slide uh, means and why we decided to upload our data. So, a recent data set we have uploaded is the data set that accompanies a manuscript called A Phenomics Approach for In Vitro Antiviral Drug Discovery. And this is a collaborative effort from people in the ULAS Pute lab. Uh, and this project was especially led by uh, Jordi Carreras Beufer, together with colleagues from the Helleday lab in Solna. So since phenomics is a rather new term and not everyone might have heard of it, I will take the opportunity to shortly explain what it means. 
So phenomics is also known as image-based morphological profiling of the cells. And so rather than looking at molecular profiles, such as you would do, for instance, in transcriptomics or proteomics, this morphological profiling looks at cellular uh, features by studying the morphological uh, features in depth. So this field has been boosted by a technique called cell painting, which was described by Bray et al. in 2016. Phenomics is a data-driven approach. So rather than having one question and then doing your experiments, you try to like capture as much information as possible and then ask the research questions later, other than the other way around. So we have used this morphological profiling techniques uh, to study viral infection. So we have um, we have studied the human coronavirus strain 229E, which is a family uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and it's a common model to study the replication and pathogenesis of the coronaviruses. And we stained this, the lung cells, the MRC5 lung fibroblast, with seven stains for important cell organelles. And next to that, we also stained for virus proteins, so we could select infected cells. The experiments were performed in multiple plates, then imaged with an automated microscope, and we imaged five channels of each site. And like in the in the um, in the data set that we have published, we looked at nine antiviral drugs, which is of course still rather limited. And currently, we are also working with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and that will be in a bigger screen. And we hope to share that data also soon with the community. So, like in a in a summary, like our project had different stages, and we tried to share as much as possible. So, in the experimental stage, we have described the methods, which combines cell painting with antibody staining for virus. And this is described in the aforementioned manuscript. Then we have done the data generation and all these raw images, which is 13,000 images in this case, we have shared it in Figshare, as well as our image analysis pipelines, which um, includes quality control, then elimination correction, as well as feature extraction. And then last, we also uh, shared the extracted features. So dependent on where, where people are working with, we are hoping that they can use different parts of, of this and use it in their own research. Then, of course, the big question of today is why did we use our, the SciLife Lab data repository? So First of all, we think it's important to make the science more transparent and reusable to, to share it in such a repository. Then, especially the type of data that we generate in our lab, it's high content data. And there can be multiple questions asked on this data. Maybe when people have a different interest or a different type of analysis, they might, uh, it might give new insights. And more specifically, why we decided to use the SciLife Lab data repository is mostly because we really like the flexibility to upload big files and also to include different types of files and also the good support to uh, actually know how to get everything in place. So as, as many of us nowadays are working with uh, rather big, big data sets, it's of course important that there's good documentation on how to get all this data in the repository. So in our case, we had about 13,000 images and as well, this big feature, feature files, which was about 100 gigabytes of data. And unfortunately, you cannot just drag and drop this type of big files, especially if you work in a, in a computing um, node or if you are working in the cloud. But happily, there is, there's very good uh, documentation available both on the SciLife Lab data repository website and uh, the GitHub uh, with some examples on how to uh, do streaming uploads, for instance, using FTP, Python, or Bash. 
so that has been really helpful for us. Um, last but not least, I also want to shine a light on some other data sets that we have published in our lab before. We have a lot of different things already out there, including, for instance, data sets, posters, presentations. And we're also hoping soon to be able to share our deep learning models there. So thank you, and I would be happy to answer questions if some arise later on. Thank you very much, Jana. That's really interesting to hear another sort of perspective of how to use this system. Um, we will go on with a third a user's perspective talk from Mikael Selin uh, from U Uppsala University, and he's also a Scilab Lab fellow. So welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation and good day, everybody. Can I get a verification that you see my screen? Yes. All right, so thanks for the invitation to present our user perspective. We were introduced to this repository by an introduction for the Silent Lab Fellows held by Hanna and Yuan a while back and became curious because it fitted with a specific need in our group. But I thought I'll first tell you what, what we are about, what we're doing. So my name is Mikael Selin. And together with some really great colleagues of mine, I had a, an infection biology research laboratory at Uppsala University and Scilife Lab. This is the group, and our focus is on understanding the molecular basis and the cellular basis for infectious disease, primarily um, gut bacterial infections, such as Salmonella and Shigella and other pretty nasty bugs. And we use a wide variety of techniques to, to study this process. But here I thought, in the interest of uh, why we got keen on using the repository, I thought I'll share one of our project trajectories. And that deals with using um, organotypic culture to model the gut and infections in the gut. So here in the upper left, you see an image of me and two of my colleagues, Pilar and Maria Letizia. We are down at uh, the clinical ward picking up a little bit of gut tissue. And from this, we can extract uh, stem cells and we can reconstitute miniature organs, organoids, that uh, to a really nice degree uh, resemble the, the gut in, in your bodies or, or in a mouse or in another mammal. And uh, to the upper right, you see an example of what this can look like. You have this beautiful structure with a standing epithelial layer, just as uh, would be happening in your gut. And there's a central lumen, and we can then deposit in our bacteria here. And uh, Jens Eriksson, who you see in the bottom photo there, um, has been employed in the group to build a microscope platform that's compatible with, with studying infections in these miniature organs. So we can then place these organoids on our microscopy stage. We can expose them to our microbes, and we can study in real time the interactions that occur between the microbe and uh, the host. I think this provides a lot of exciting and uh, emerging possibilities for us to really get into the dynamics of infectious disease. However, it also comes with some caveats, and this is where the data repository comes in. So I thought I'll briefly share our, um, our ride in one of these projects. Uh, up here you see Petra Geiser. She's a very talented PhD student in the group, and she's been pioneering one way of studying um, infections in these organoid models. And that's by keeping the organoid intact, which means you have this epithelial layer enclosing a central lumen. And to keep that intact, but still expose it to the bacteria in the right way, you need to poke a hole with a microinjection needle into that central cavity, you deposit the bacteria, and then you can place this on the microscopy stage. And Petra has been exploring this and uh, been quite successful in doing so. And she's been managing then to map the entire infection cycle of, of a typical prototype bacterium, Salmonella typhimurium, uh, using live microscopy and fluorescently labeled bacteria. So I thought just I would exemplify here. In these images, you see the microinjection process itself. Uh, Megan also highlighted some of these movies already on, that are present on the repository. But you see that there is this fluorescent bacteria being deposited in the central lumen. And in the bottom panels, um, we just exemplify one key point in the infectious cycle of these bacteria, which is 
as they have invaded the epithelium, the infected epithelial cells also expel back into the lumen. And we can trace this in real time. So we were coming towards the sort of the end of this first project, establishing this new model, and we wanted to get it out there and, and com convey it to the community, the publication. And we have successfully done so in the last year. And you find the paper here, it's published in MBIO a few months back. Um, but something that we came across in this process is that, well, we get a lot of experimental data and it's really information dense and it illustrates a lot of the concepts, the dynamic concepts that we want to convey, uh, but they are annoyingly large. And when we started looking into journals to submit this, this manuscript to, we came up on uh, restrictions for the number of supplementary items, the size of supplementary items. And we felt like it looked like we had to, to cut away at a lot of the dynamic information, which felt like a shame. And then I attended um, one of these introduction events for the fellows that Hanna and Yuan uh, were nice enough to give us. And we realized that uh, we could use the SciLife Lab data repository as, a, as an additional supplement repository for, for specifically this project. So I thought I'll just briefly take you to that little process. That was a, a sort of an experiment we ran in real time for doing this because for our lab, it was actually the first time uh, using a repository of this kind. It will certainly not be the last. So we were preparing the manuscript. Me and Petra were working heavily on this and trying to, to get it done and submitted. So we had the draft and we had an idea what we wanted to submit as main material. But at the same time, we, we selected our best movies that it would illustrate the key concepts, and we placed them in the SciLife Lab data repository. And we already there booked a digital object identifier number, which is a key thing, I think, here for, for backtracing. We then sent it, and it got out for review. We were very happy about that. And here I thought, I think there's a really nice feature of the repository. Uh, and that is that you don't have to publish this to have it under review with the journal you can uh, generate a, a private link. And this we added into the manuscript as a private link that the reviewers could click on, go to the repository and review uh, the video material together with the main article, but without us committing to publishing it forever. Then we got it back and we were really pleased to see that the reviewers were enthusiastic about this work and only had some minor comments. So we took care of that and while revising the manuscript and resubmitting that. We also pruned and made a formal publication grade version of the online repository for the video material. For instance, adding in the final abstract, adding in links or ready links for to the journal and so on. And so we prepared it for public release. And we resubmitted back to the journal and eventually got an acceptance note. And then there is the processing period where this should be type edited. Uh, so here we decided them for an embargoed public release. And I think this was also a feature that was very smooth that we could just decide on a date. And after deciding on that date, I could get a mandate myself to keep track of that date and even change it if, if needed. So that the public release of the large supplemental data set here would go hand in hand with the publication of the main manuscript. So eventually what we ended up in uh, was that we had our paper published. We were very happy about this. It came out in January this year. And on this very same day, we also published the supplementary movie set. And now there is a reciprocal link system between these. So if someone stumbles upon our paper, they can find the supplemental movies. But also as happened today, if someone browses through the repository and sees this could be a cool item, they will easily be directed also to the journal article to, to learn more. So this was quite a smooth process. And um, our curiosity then was uh, going in the direction of figuring out, is this worth it? Is there anything to gain from this? It looks elegant, but as we're scientists, we want to, to have experimental data suggesting, is there added value by this process or not? And I think we have proof that there is. Uh, I think this is quite an enlightening example of this. So we had the paper being published in January of, uh, of this year and the supplement movies as well. And this is published in a journal that's driven by the American Society of Microbiology, ASM. And they have a really cool podcast that I can recommend 
to anyone that's interested in infections. It's called TWIM, or This Week in Microbiology. And they, said, they decided to feature our paper, which we were very happy about, in the podcast that came in the weeks after, after our release. Uh, the only thing I'm not very enthusiastic about in this podcast is the title. Uh, this corkscrewing through snot actually refers to that. There can be mucus in the intestine and salmonella bacteria can swim around clouds of mucus. But in either case, they highlighted our, our story and described it in great detail. Uh, and I thought they, they made a good, uh, yeah, they made good points about it. But one thing that they specifically said, the editors um, having this podcast was this. So they said they enjoyed reading this paper. They learned a lot from it. And specifically, they have videos posted that are freely available. So you can actually follow along and witness the science occurring in real time. And what they referred to here was that they clicked these links. They went to the SciLife Lab data repository. And they downloaded and viewed this in parallel with reading the paper. So to summarize our experience then, we learned that this repository is a fairly convenient, it's also a flexible solution. And as has been touched upon today, it's a flexible solution for a wide variety of different purposes. For our use uh, so far, it's been largely to, to fit in important data sets that wouldn't make it into an article, but still needs to be published side by side. And this also alleviates an annoyance, at least in my view, that there is always when you submit um, a manuscript or journal, you have to at the very last editing stage sort of shrink all the files and trying to cram everything in. And there's no need for that anymore. You can simply use this as a, a powerful supplement. I also enjoy the versioning and that you can book a digital object identifier that then will be coming along in the process and eventually be published along this. Um, at the, at the final stage. And maybe as something I would recommend others to do, you're usually pressed on time. So you just try to figure it out by sending emails to Han or you one or someone else. And I did that a lot. Um, they were really helpful. But maybe I would suggest to read the instructions beforehand so you don't have to bother them as much as I did. But I, I'm grateful for their help. So I think to sum off, uh, I think that why I was invited to, to give this user perspective was that after finishing this process, I sent a very enthusiastic email thanking them for, for this smooth ride. So I think I'll uh, leave off there and together with the others, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mikkel. And, and I'm, I'm, I mean, we're happy to help and we're really happy that this could be of, of a really good use for you in the process. And it's been really interesting to hear how you, I mean, how we can go along in, in the whole process with you. So thank you very much for sharing this uh, with us. Um, now we will uh, switch into a, another presentation with sort of a wider perspective uh, with uh, FAIR as a factor for bigger research impact uh, by Volmar nyberg Wackerström, who's a data steward at uh, INBIS and part of the data management team that we also work closely together with. So please, Volmar. All right, can you confirm that you hear me? Yes, and we see your presentation. Fantastic. Uh, so as Hanna mentioned, my name is Volmar. I work at Scilaf Labs bioinformatics platform and me and my colleagues work closely with data center. And we also offer consultations and support and training on data management to research projects and researchers. Uh, so this is gonna be a orientation through the FAIR guiding principles and how they influence data sharing and reuse. So you probably heard of these uh, at some point already. So why are we talking about data sharing? I mean, uh, in general, at the moment, uh, there is kind of a big push towards uh, making research data available. And in the Swedish uh, research bill, the current one, uh, you will find a quote like this one, research data shall be made accessible as open as possible and as closed as necessary. So it's kind of open by default unless uh, otherwise uh, kind of restricted. Uh, and the EU has a similar uh, open science policy. Uh, so it's trickling down from EU to Sweden. And uh, there we actually see, uh, also see fair mentioned and 
we have open data sharing should become the default for the results of EU funded scientific research. So policy makers are pushing for research data to be made available as openly as possible. Uh, and there are big investments being made in infrastructure and skills for data sharing and reuse uh, across Europe and uh, even beyond. So we see initiatives like the European Open Science Cloud, uh, which uh, builds infrastructure and kind of tool chains on top of uh, uh, ecosystem of uh, data for research. Uh, and we also see uh, more kind of um, domain specific infrastructures such as Elixir uh, evolving. And we have uh, the Elixir Sweden node here at SciLife Lab and the NBIS uh, platform. And we also have the Swedish National Data Service, which is kind of a collaboration between a few universities, which also kind of focus on offering uh, support on uh, research data management questions. Uh, so there's a lot of support around these types of uh, uh, skills and, and problems uh, to be had in, in Sweden. And, and we are still kind of in a learning process, I would say. There's no kind of best way to uh, really kind of work with research data in all. Uh, I mean, you, you can't do it in the same way uh, for all uh, situations. Uh, but some of the big motivating factors is the democratic principles of, I mean, if it's publicly funded, it should be available to the public. Uh, and there's also a, a good research practices that this is just kind of the normal way of doing research. And uh, societal and academic impact getting kind of additional benefit, lowering costs and, and uh, new innovations. Uh, so this is on the broad level and zooming in on the individual, where are we at uh, then? Uh, so there are some research uh, and this is not a recent paper, but it just illustrates the point that papers with publicly available microarray data in this case received more citations than similar papers that did not make the data available. And this was even after controlling for variables uh, that could influence the citation rates. Uh, I mean, from other perspectives, such as the, the authors and, and their credentials and so forth. Uh, but they found that data citation alone contributed with uh, an increased citation rate of about 9%. So, uh, I mean, th there is uh, a small kind of gain in, in the citation rate by successfully just sharing your data and making it available uh, in your articles. Uh, and by striving to be fair, you also make it easier for your future self and collaborators to use the data you are producing now. So you will probably be a user and reuser of your own research data at some point or your collaborators uh, research data and following the, the same uh, guidelines and uh, becoming effective in those uh, will just put you up in a good position because uh, I think these are kind of common sense principles uh, when you boil down to it. Uh, and you are also getting prepared for future opportunities uh, as the uh, guidelines and regulations are kind of progressively becoming a bit stricter around sharing requirements. Uh, so it's good to kind of get a feeling for this now, even though you maybe don't have the requirement uh, or the, the blowtorch uh, on you uh, just yet. Uh, the FAIR principles, they emerged and in, evolved in user communities. Uh, so uh, there is a diverse set of stakeholders involved, representing academia, industry, funding agencies, and scholarly publishers. Uh, and the original paper that was published uh, where they summarized these principles, they, they uh, were kind of collaboratively trying to endorse a concise set uh, of actionable guiding principles. Uh, so it's not a standard and it's not a binary evaluation metric. It's more of a uh, kind of uh, best effort or, or uh, aim uh, towards where, where to go. Uh, and the focus is on efficient data use and reuse. 
Uh, and today that also includes software and tools. Uh, so what the fair guiding principles contribute with is uh, beyond good data stewardship, which has been explored for a long time. Uh, they also include the perspective of getting this to work with infrastructure and software uh, uh, tooling that, that uh, are in the hands of the researchers today and in the future. Uh, uh, so this is the title of the original papal paper, the Fair Guiding uh, Principles for Scientific Data Management and Stewardship. Uh, and they promote efficient data discovery and reuse by providing guidelines to make digital resources uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So that's the acronym FAIR. Uh, and uh, they also specifically address this aspect of enabling software and infrastructure to automatically find and use uh, research data. So that is kind of the key here. Uh, FAIR also fits into the uh, data lifecycle, and there are many versions of this. This is uh, one that we have used in the Elixir project and uh, something called the RDM kit. Uh, so we, we think about the uh, research uh, project and maybe focused on kind of the research data sets that are produced uh, on this lifecycle. So you go from kind of planning uh, the, the uh, data handling uh, to collecting, uh, processing, analyzing, preserving it somewhere in an archive or uh, the position database, and then sharing this uh, as part of publications or uh, as part of public record. Uh, and then you have this kind of reuse, which would turn uh, previous research data into uh, new uh, research data. Uh, so the FAIR principles, you could say that they rely on good data management practices to start with in all phases of, of research. Uh, and good data management practices include uh, considerations such as ethics and legislation, uh, information security, uh, research documentation, uh, and data organization. Uh, and with this, I want to stress that FAIR data uh, does not mean that it necessarily is open data. Uh, I mean, uh, they are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, but there can be terms to who can access it and for what purposes, so to speak. Uh, so you should carefully consider what data and versions you are to preserve and under what conditions they will be shared. And if we start looking at these principles a little bit more in detail, uh, we have the first step, uh, which would be just kind of finding data. So it should be easy both for humans and for computers to do this. And I'm not going to go into uh, technical details on, on how a computer would, would actually go about this process. Uh, but uh, as uh, a human user, uh, you can kind of check off or tick off uh, some things that kind of uh, would make it easier for a computer as well. Uh, so the first thing you need is a way of identifying the data uh, and making sure that you can rely on that identity to make sure, reach or get a hold of that same data in the future. So uh, as you would do a citation for an article, you would want to cite a data set or something similar. Uh, and you should also check that you can find the data when you search for them by descriptive uh, attributes uh, related to that data set. So they should be available in some sort of search index. Uh, and uh, we already saw a demonstration of uh, the, the Figshare uh, interface. Uh, and uh, we also heard that this is indexed by Google. So, I mean, you, you can find stuff that's uh, available in, in Figshare on these search uh, services. There are other kind of community standards for search. Uh, and if you can, you should make sure that they are available uh, in your community's uh, search uh, indexes. Uh, and some guiding principles uh, to go towards a bit more of a technical uh, 
level. Uh, you should try to make sure that uh, you describe your data with rich metadata. And uh, we're going to go into what metadata is in a, a little while. Uh, and then we're going to have to assign a unique and persistent identifier to our data set. Uh, and one example of that is a DOI. And we already uh, saw uh, some examples of how that is done in Figshare. Uh, and this should also be included in, in the actual metadata description. Uh, and then we should make sure that the data uh, are actually findable using uh, a search service. Uh, and I'm going to kind of touch a little bit on the metadata and unique and persistent identifier aspects before we go on to the other uh, principles or categories of principles in, in the FAIR. Uh, so a unique and persistent identifier uh, that is kind of the shell or, or the outer uh, identification of, of your uh, research data that you want to reach. Uh, so they are kind of labels that help us uniquely identify either physical or digital objects and services. So this is kind of, you can use it quite ubiquitously. Uh, but when we talk about research data, we ideally want an identifier that is globally unique. So, I mean, th there shouldn't be two items in, in the world with the same uh, unique ID. Uh, it should be persistent. And by that, I mean, there should never be a broken link. Uh, so uh, if you compare it to a URL on the internet, uh, if a journal moves to another domain or something like that, you will might lose the link to your uh, uh, data sets that were in the, the uh, supplementary materials or something on the, those lines. And then it should also be resolvable uh, in some manner. And uh, this uh, means that it should uh, be able to take this uh, identifier, uh, put it into some sort of service and then get a link to the actual place where the data is stored. So uh, a lookup service of some sort. And a DOI is one example that meets all the requirements. And so does several other uh, identifiers. Uh, but uh, in this case, we get the DOI from uh, Figshare. So we're going to focus on that one. Uh, and the structure of a DOI uh, is um, first a set of uh, two numbers uh, followed by a dot. And then we have four numbers followed by a slash and then a series of, of uh, numbers and uh, or letters. Uh, so the first part of it is kind of maintained by Crossref, who, who uh, minted the DUI system. So you can uh, get uh, a license to issue new DUIs. Uh, and uh, this uh, particular prefix, 10.5281, is maintained by Zenodo. Uh, and they then define the uh, suffix, the end part of this uh, DUI, uh, which identify the unique data set. So the combination of this is, is globally uh, unique. Uh, and Zenodo is responsible for maintaining this. So if they would move their services from their uh, current location to somewhere else, then they would have to redirect all of these DUI links to that new location. Uh, so uh, a, a DUI is kind of an indirection service. So you can be sure that as long as you trust the person maintaining that uh, uh, scope of, of uh, DUIs, uh, you will be able to kind of redirect your links to the proper target, uh, even if your uh, article is, is published, uh, was published 10 years ago, and now you know that the data has moved. So it's a nice way of kind of making sure that this is going to stick and work for a very long time. Uh, the second level here is protocols or access protocols. And the reason I'm using these terms is because if you read the actual principles, you will encounter them. And I just want to give you a brief introduction to, to what they are, and they are also conceptually important. Uh, so this is actually how you get from your identifier to the, the uh, actual website where you can download it or, or something similar. Uh, so it's kind of procedures to uh, access data and metadata and other documents. 
Uh, and you should prefer to use well-established protocols such as the HTTP uh, and the FTP protocols. So this is how web browsers normally connect to the internet and download a web page. Uh, you would type in a URL uh, and then it would kind of uh, connect uh, through this protocol uh, to the server somewhere and, and get the document that you're uh, looking for. Uh, and uh, we can get this kind of working very well and fully automated uh, seamlessly when we click uh, our way through the internet. Uh, but this might not be fully uh, possible when we're talking about sensitive data or, or data that needs to be restricted for one reason or another. Uh, so in that case, you might have to provide some sort of contact details and clear instructions on how you would actually uh, get access to, to the uh, real data. So maybe you will end up on a landing page with some instructions instead of going forward to the actual uh, data. Uh, and then we have uh, one more kind of uh, inner layer of metadata, which kind of des describes the data before actually accessing it. Uh, so it can be used for indexing the resource, kind of uh, getting a, an outline of what's uh, expected to be in there without actually opening the data and digging into the, the uh, bits and bytes of them. Uh, so uh, you could define metadata as uh, data that uh, defines and describes other data or resources uh, or information that defines and describes other data and resources. Uh, what's uh, usually kind of a key aspects of metadata is that it's structured. So it's, it, it has kind of this inherent structure to it. So it's very similar to, to just ordinary data. And it's a matter of perspective. It can be part of your published data as well. Uh, so metadata is everywhere uh, from a file name uh, and the file extension to embedded camera details in a picture uh, to a table listing tissue samples and their properties. Uh, and you should use widely adopted, uh, adopted templates and vocabularies when you uh, flesh out your, your metadata so that you are kind of consistent with your peers and colleagues uh, and that you will understand uh, others' structures and, and the, the, the meanings. And the actual data uh, that's uh, representing observations, measurements, and information as bits and bytes, uh, and all digital file formats are in some sort of danger of becoming outdated. And if that happens, uh, future software may not be able to read or uh, show the content correctly. So you should choose a file format that is likely to be usable in the future, and also document the content structure and relationships between your data files. To, to make sure that you are, uh, your data is not lost uh, from carelessness. Uh, so this is kind of uh, data seen as a digital resource, as they mentioned in the, in the uh, uh, FAIR principles. Uh, so if we go to accessible, uh, we have once identified, uh, we need to know how to locate and access them. Uh, the data that is. Uh, you can obtain the data from wherever it's located it is kind of what you should test for. Uh, and uh, that you can also issue a request to get access if the data is not shared openly. Uh, for the more technical level, uh, you should make sure that uh, you can access uh, the data using a widely adopted communications protocol, usually HTTP, and that's the case for uh, FigShare and then provide a means to request the data if access is restricted uh, and then keep the metadata available even if the data is removed so you don't end up in a 404 kind of this page does not exist instead you get that this uh, data has been removed for this and this uh, reason uh, and if you want to read more about the FAIR principles, you can go into the GoFAIR uh, website and they have a, a listing of, of all the details. So I'm gonna very quickly go through the, the lost parts of them. And if you want to read more, you can go through them on the website. So for interoperable, uh, we are talking about integrating data in our own workflows. And that means that we can open the files and read their contents and understand the data that they uh, and what the data represent. 
uh, and uh, to uh, implement that, you should use a formal, accessible, and shared, broadly applicable language for knowledge representation. And this is copied very bottom from the, the website. Uh, so it basically means use templates and common language that others uh, have used before you, so you understand each other. And uh, also use vocabularies that follow the FAIR principle, so that the vocabularies themselves are also published uh, and available and include the PIDs and links to required resources that are related to this uh, data set. For reuse, uh, we should uh, make sure that data is well described and accessible to machines. Uh, and that means that you should uh, make sure that you have uh, made clear to what extent the data can be used in your project. Uh, and also uh, that you can combine the data with other sources with acceptable effort. So it should be easy and facilitating uh, reuse is kind of the key in the FAIR principles. Uh, and I'm gonna skip the guiding, guiding principles here. You can, as I said, read up on them on the website. And instead, I'm gonna jump into one example of how you can select uh, a data repository based on your uh, needs. Uh, so the best way to make your data fair is to choose a, a commonly used data repository. And you do that by determining if the data is sensitive or need to be protected or not to start with. Uh, and if it needs to be restricted access, the Europe European Genome Phenome Archive is one of the few places uh, where this is going to be possible in the future. At the moment, we uh, can create kind of these placeholder uh, records in Figshare. Uh, with only metadata that you can cite, but that will not allow anyone to download the data. So it's kind of an advertisement of data to, uh, that could potentially be uh, accessed or uh, that could be used in collaboration projects with your research group. If it's not sensitive, you should choose a discipline specific repository if it exists. Uh, and uh, examples of those are the European uh, Nucleotide Archive, PRIDE, and some others. Uh, and in this case, we are actually looking at an institutional data repository when it comes to Figshare. So this is the SciLife Lab uh, supported uh, place to, to store uh, data. But there are others at Stockholm University, for example, and SND, the Swedish National uh, Data Service, also has a repository where you can store uh, data. And then there are general data repositories outside of uh, the management of, of these institutions that you can also use uh, freely. Uh, yes, uh, so I see that I'm a bit short <laughs> over time, Hannah. Uh, I think we have a few minutes, so that's fine. All right. In that case, I, I will kind of just go quickly over uh, an example of how uh, the verification can be done for a submission to ENA. Uh, and uh, basically we're starting with kind of sequenced biomaterials. And what we do is take these uh, uh, descriptions of, of the actual samples and put them in a uh, spreadsheet uh, according to some commonly uh, decided or agreed standards. We also have raw reads that are produced according to kind of common experimental setups and documented according uh, to some common uh, practice standards. Uh, and then we have uh, anal potential analysis or results of analysis that uh, as well kind of conform to some sort of standard. So we have these standard, uh, standardized files uh, and then we have some submission tooling that's available from the ENA and we end up with uh, some files put on the ENA's upload area and they are then in extension kind of mirrored out or um, advertised to the COVID-19 data portal and, and biosamples and several other places. So this is how you would make it available or the, the broad scopes perspective of what's going in and out. Uh, and for the sample sequence materials or the sequence biomaterials, we have uh, that each uh, um, record should have a unique name, so to speak. Each sample should have a unique ID uh, and they should always be uh, associated with a taxon. Uh, 
but beyond that there's several checklists that are uh, specific to certain types of submissions or research areas such as the ENA virus uh, pathogen reporting standard checklist and that has 35 fields uh, from which nine are required 15 recommended and 11 optional so there we have kind of a standard on uh, which terms to use. It's a formal language of some sort, uh, and uh, we expect the result to be very similar and be browsable across uh, different submissions. Uh, and you should make sure that you kind of prepare this early on. Get a, a sample uh, spreadsheet set up according to the uh, submission guidelines. Uh, right when you start uh, planning your data collection, because then it's going to be easier to submit and maybe uh, you remember to collect some additional metadata that would be uh, potentially make your uh, data more reusable and, and citable by others. Uh, and then we have an example with the uh, Scilife Lab uh, repository. Uh, and here I have just shown you the, the guidelines for the uh, data repository submission. Uh, so here we have explanations of the different metadata fields in, in the data repository. Uh, here you, by yourself, need to kind of figure out which file formats would be uh, useful in the future or likely uh, usable in the future. Uh, also which uh, templates to use for your metadata and uh, you should also consider adding a readme to maybe show uh, people who download the data uh, the description that was actually part of of the figure uh, internal system and then you can add a manifest files to make sure that uh, or let people make sure that nothing has been lost in transit uh, giving details about the uh, file sizes, uh, potentially um, about uh, the uh, kind of file hashes or, or a fingerprint of the file, uh, so that uh, someone who gets this data, maybe not directly from Figshare or not directly from you or over an unstable connection, can verify that everything went well in transit and they can be sure that the data is intact before they do the, their actual analysis. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to list a few <laughs> good practices that I encourage you to follow. Uh, so you should secure and organize your data, uh, deposit and share your data using restricted or public access data repositories that promote the fair data principles. This is the easiest way to kind of promote fairness in your uh, own data sharing. Uh, and adhere to community standards uh, wherever you can. If there are any, uh, try to figure out. Uh, and you should maintain a data management plan or some aspects of it uh, to uh, have some common practices when it comes to uh, file naming and, and metadata and, and uh, things like that. Thank you very much, Walmar, for that very interesting and comprehensive presentation of the aspects of, of the FAIR principles. Um, so I think uh, that was our um, last presentation for today, and we will now open up for questions from uh, the participants. So uh, please go ahead if you have questions to our speakers today. Yes, maybe we can uh, start with uh, addressing the question that was sent in the chat earlier. Um, so I can read it for you who haven't seen it. Uh, so the question was, uh, will it be possible for a preprint manuscript with a preprint DOI to show up if there, uh, there is not yet an existing uh, peer-reviewed article in the repository? And uh, Megan, you answered that from a, um, a sort of technical, technical perspective. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah. maybe you could uh, repeat some of that and then maybe you yeah. you could uh, also comment if you like on this. Yeah, absolutely. So the option to include the um, peer reviewed title in the DOI and have it sort of link out so people can look at the publication directly from the item page on Figshare. Um, it's totally possible to put a, a preprint DOI um, into that field. Um, it doesn't really matter um sort of where the DOI comes from as long as it's a valid DOI um and we can change from a technical perspective the text on that 
um, link out to, to not say peer reviewed. Um, some institutions have changed it just to say, read the publication or to take you to the publisher's website or something a bit more generic um, than that. So yeah, from technical perspective, it's completely fine from a um, sort of policy perspective. I guess that, yeah, that's up to, to you, Han. I, I'd encourage it very much, of course. It's, it just adds great to transparency. So of, of course, we would like that very much to see. Great, thank you. Um, we have uh, any other questions from the audience? Um, maybe Anna, we should bring up some of the. Oh, Mark, Martin Mikkelsen has a question. Yes, sorry. Yeah, thank Go you ahead, so much for a very interesting presentations. I just a short clarification. Uh, I think you Megan mentioned earlier the possibility of, of working with the collaborators in projects. Uh, I'm just maybe I missed the detail, but as as uh, Yuan mentioned initially. Everything, everything really put in the repository will be published. It's just a question of when. So, so in the in the case then of the example that Megan showed with with comments and, and internal communication in some way within the project, how does that, does that relate to the publishing? Is it? I just try to grasp that that aspect with especially working with this project uh, uh, aspect, or is it? That it's it's not to be used in that way for the site repository, and it's more for related to the platform. Thank you. From a technical perspective, so obviously it depends on how you know, Silo Web wants to use it. Um, but the project functionality. So if you leave comments and and notes and things, and then you do go on to publish the project itself none of that becomes publicly available it's just the items within it um, that you can publish and they become publicly available as well as some of the metadata around the project which is things like the title the project description who the collaborators are and things like that um, so all of that stays stays public uh, i'm sorry it stays private um, all of the notes and things stay private um, for, for people in the in the project um, but yeah how you, I guess how you want to use it and sort of the, again, the policy around that. Um, I'll leave somebody else to, to talk about. No, so, so I think my, the, the point I was go, making in the beginning was that, yes, absolutely, like Megan says, it's, it's absolutely possible to, that, to prepare an item for publication and, and work on it together as a project and, and only parts of that will go public at the point where you essentially choose to publish it. Mm -hmm. uh, what I, what I was mostly referring to is that you shouldn't see, because we got these questions before, that the figure here is not meant to be a kind of storage area where a project will upload and share files like a Dropbox style manner, you know. The, the point of the repository is to publish and prepare for publishing. It's not meant for a kind of file sharing area for, for projects. That, that was what I wanted. Yeah, I, I suspected that so, as much, but I just wanted to uh, get a clarification. So thank you for that. Great, thanks for that question. Um, more questions? So maybe we should bring up some of the previous ones, Anna. Yeah, uh, well, I can uh, direct one question to you, Joan. Um, as you mentioned in the introduction that it's possible to add links when you upload an item to the repository, you can add links to resources and references used. Um, mm. So do you believe that this uh, should be like a standalone item, the items that are uploaded to? The repository. Um, do you mean? I'm not sure exactly what you what you mean by that. But my point was for, about adding links is essentially that when you're creating something, if you've worked on a project or publishing something, 
it's a good idea to bring in, if you have items that are stored or linked or published elsewhere, in order to keep the keep the fig share entry the place where you can find all the information about what you published. Then you add the links in here if you have other DOIs or if you have if you have sort of repository identifiers that are not persistent. You would still be able to add them here and you can change them and it will still help with findability. So say for example that you have a paper that you have published in a journal, you get a DOI for that one it will be linked to maybe uh, raw data sets that have been published in one or two EBI repositories. Then you can add the web links and, and the uh, identifiers to their archives to the same item, and you can keep that together. So you can create an item essentially with, with a lot of links and with added material, maybe supplementary material or whatever, that gives you complete picture of, of the study. So it, it just gives you a way to aggregate information in the way that you make it to make the, and the, the data set itself, the item complete as much as possible. Great, uh, thank you. Um, so any further question? Tia, yes. Uh, hi, uh, I was wondering when, when a data set is made public, um, is it like one level that uh, everyone can download, like you said, like you don't need to have an account, or is it possible to have different levels, such as sometimes we say that we share data upon request. Um, is there a way to handle that or, yeah. I think Megan might be able to answer yeah. this, but also some maybe upcoming functionality. Yes, so um, there are ways of restricting access to either certain groups of people or to allow users to request access. So under the embargo um, uh, section, when you're uploading an item, there's um, some request access functionality um, and you can have um, sort of some text that people will see when they go to request access. So like if, for example, you are restricting it to certain um, certain types of individuals, you might say, I'm, you know, it, it's only available for these type, these types of people, um, but get in touch if you think you should have, have access. And then it would, an email would go to the user and to the administrator of, of the system um, and would allow you to determine whether you could grant access. Um, granting access would have to happen outside of Figshare at this current stage. So this is a new piece of functionality, this request access. Um, so eventually we would look at the possibility of allowing you to do that within the system because it's new, um, it would sort of have to be done outside. Um, but yeah, there's there's plenty of options for restricting it to certain people or requesting access, just whatever is, is necessary. Okay, thanks. Uh, great, thank you for that question. Um, any more questions? We have any other uh, previous ones Anna to bring up? Um, uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, I can direct one question to you, Volmar, about uh, you mentioned that the uh, uh, DOI to this item uh, is uh, to be included in the met metadata. Uh, could you maybe um, develop a bit more about why that is uh, necessary to do? What's the idea behind that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so the idea is that metadata does not necessarily have to be uh, available on the same service as the actual data. So you can have several uh, metadata descriptions of the same piece of, of data somewhere, and then you would include the DUI to the data in the metadata, so to speak. Uh, in, in Figshare today, uh, we have Kind of the same DUI for the metadata record and, and the data set. So there's just one. But there are situations when a machine would maybe cross over from another service into the, the Figshare service to kind of find the, the endpoints of several different data sets or something like that. 
Great, thank you. Um, do we have any final question, maybe? Before we end this. Um, if not, uh, I would just like to share the uh, final slide with you uh, for further contacts and questions that can be sent to us or to the speakers. And I would uh, like to thank, I mean, the speakers of today for really nice and interesting presentations and user perspectives. Um, I'd like to thank Anna for organizing everything. And of course, uh, all of you for uh, joining us today for this uh, launch event. And uh, uh, I wish you a nice day and I say thank you from our side. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.